I really love the Wii U. Oh yeah, forgot this is a sin to say out loud. But who am I kidding? The Wii U to me was always a blast to own. The thought of being able to play your games without a TV or in the bathroom, and these aren't the shitty handheld games around the DS. I mean, just look at this. Bro, this is fucking disgusting. Ugh, fucking pixels, man, gross. These are the top of the line HD high quality AAA products that were being given to on the Wii U. If it was 2006, because most of these were early PS3 games anyways that came to the Wii U. And the amount of ports like this that we got wasn't even that much to begin with. Look, I really love the Wii U, but it's pretty obvious that the Wii U wasn't all there power wise. While the Wii U did get ports of games that were on the PS3 and Xbox 360 like Resident Evil Revelations, Assassin's Creed, and strangely enough we got Mass Effect 3 and Darksiders 2 but never got any of the other games. So I don't even know why they bothered. While it was impressive these games were even running on the Wii U and actually even looking better while doing it, these versions were known to have horrible performance issues and crashed a lot. While on one hand, again, it's cool I can play these on the gamepad away from the TV, but by doing this, you're already making these old games look even worse on the gamepad screen, as it puts out a worse image quality than if you played on the TV. But again, as I stated before, I can't help but love this system, man. With the announcement of Sony's own version of the Wii U, I think it's time to do some reminiscing on the Wii U and see what really made me fall in love with this slightly gray sheep of Nintendo's past, since the black sheep still is the virtual boy. the prevailing thought would be this. Yes, the game will probably still be right for all of us, but could it also be a perfect fit just for you? And the answer to that question is an emphatic, absolutely. In fact, we're so convinced of it that we put that pronoun right in the name. So today, Welcome to the world of We You. I was one of the only people out of all my friends who bought a Wii U around launch. I even still have my original box with no inserts sadly. And man, to say I was excited was an understatement. I really do love the whole idea of being able to play the game on the gamepad, which I did so much back then. I think I played like this even more than I do with my Switch being in handheld mode. I also believe this was also during my rebellious phase where I was staying up past my bedtime to play video games even though I had school the next day. So I think that really added to why I love this so much, being able to rebel against the rules that were set against me with my Wii U. And it did help because I was basically living alone at the time with my mom working out of town and her ex just kind of there. So I basically had free reign to play and drop all my responsibilities. Hearing this bad boy start up just gives me a weird nostalgic trip. One of my fondest memories was just playing Smash till like 3am and then once everything calmed down, just letting the Wii U run. Hearing the Miis call out to talk about deals and other things in the now, it really feels so comforting. I really think the best way I can describe just the whole menu screen and the feeling it brings back is that rush you get when you're young and playing Pokemon late at night, and you find that random shiny, 
but because you're supposed to be asleep, you get that rush of excitement, but are suppressing it and trying to keep quiet. That's what this feels like to me. The wonder and amazement of an experience only Nintendo system can bring during this era, but the feeling of that suppression in the back of the mind. Suppressing those emotions, especially as half of this stuff here, either is outdated or doesn't even work anymore. Maybe this is just me, but it's kind of eerie seeing this home screen again, as Reggie's Mies coming on to tell me stuff while having the Mies talk about stuff that's long since passed. Especially since Reggie isn't even a part of Nintendo anymore. The Wii U feels like a time capsule that wasn't even trying to be one. The music really does help encapsulate that long sense of wonder and dreamlike feel. Then seeing the environment that the Mies are even in with the white and grey pattern floors that seem to stretch out for miles and miles while the shadows of clouds can be seen floating on by, as if to hint that this world is somehow outside. If the Wii U would have come out now, I easily could see this being in a lot of those liminal space videos. Something that I also never hear talked about is how the Wii U has different music for most of the channels and stuff on the system depending on if you're playing on gamepad or TV mode. It's quite impressive. It's such a little detail that I didn't find out till literally last month of being a Wii U owner. Speaking of music, the Wii U has such amazing dreamlike tracks that give me very big vibes of game OSTs like Yumaniki and Omori, especially the song that plays from the Parental Control channel. You can really feel just how otherworldly this music can get at times. Most of the time the gamepad would be full of the more upbeat versions of the tracks while the TV would have the more ambient side to it all. It's probably why the Wii U music just hits right. It definitely has hit way harder for me now since a lot of the music I listen to while working on videos is like Silent Hill type stuff. So I can say, this holds up still very well. If there's one thing I feel anyone can say about the Wii and the Wii U that no one can say about the Nintendo Switch is the amount of just random shit on these menus. You had the weather channel, you had everybody votes channel, you even had the news and it's where I get my trusted news from, so don't at me with your fake news. Get it from Nintendo News, only real news source there is. The Wii had so much random stuff because during this time it wasn't as easy to access this stuff as it is now, so of course you want this on your new system. The Wii U may not have had much random stuff as the Wii did, but that doesn't mean weird apps weren't made for it. Since we're here, why don't we take a look at the Wii U and what it had to offer. Right off the bat, the Wii U had some of the most user friendly settings I've ever used showing full instructions with pictures to help walk you through how to use it. It's impressive because you don't see this much with systems now. I can promise you, there's random shit that my PS5 can do that I still don't know what it does. Another cool setting the gamepad has that is mostly what I use my Wii U for nowadays, which is kind of sad thinking about it, but the Wii U can be used as a TV remote. I don't know why I love this feature a lot, but I really do. This was also one of the best systems for adding other players and friends. No more friend codes, because all you need now is a Nintendo ID, and it's a simple type, and then you add them. The fact that even after all these years, I can see what I was playing with other users from back in 2018 that's crazy. I can even add them from this menu right now. The fact there's no recent player options on the Switch, but there is on the Wii U, is just crazy to me. You can even have your Mii have status messages, kind of like Guy Online for anyone who remembers that. Next stop is the first attempt Nintendo ever tried to have their console have a social networking app, and that is Miiverse. Oh boy, I can't wait. What wonder shall await me after all these ye- oh. Yeah, I forgot. Shit is closed down. There is a huge archive of Miiverse, and it's almost everything that was ever on there. It's like 19 terabytes, which is quite a lot. But, that being said, here's my post. I thought I posted more, but I did a lot of dumb drawings like Stan joins the battle and... Someone also replied to this asking what do I mean? I don't even remember what I meant. Also, I took this old screenshot of Shiny Pokemon from Rumble U, which is a series I really need to deep dive into someday. I also made a post saying my friend sucked into Tinoland, and then I got utterly exposed by this guy. 
If you want to see all of this for yourself, I'll have a link down below to the archive. It really is such a blessing they were able to save all of this for the future because man, the Miiverse memes are golden. Like the kid who just hates Just Dance, or this kid talking about whatever the fuck this is. I also found a full RP of people RPing in Miiverse and I just... I just can't man. Maybe it was a good thing it was shut down at this point, I don't know. Something I found while browsing the Lost in Time notification menu on the Wii U was an application called Wii Street U. It's just Google Earth on the Wii U, but man, I don't even remember hearing about it. But if you want to talk about weird apps, this one really blows me away, and I'm even surprised it was ever a thing that Tenno even attempted, and that is Wii U Chat. Nihon no Minisan, Kinichiwa, Nintendo, Obu America, no Reggie. Death. Man, nothing works in this goddamn system, dude. Jesus. Well, luckily this guy has footage of it working, and something I forgot about is the cool animation that happens when you join a call with someone. Once you're in a call with someone, all you really could do was draw on them or talk. It's a unique thing with how Nintendo seems to be with online stuff. I never would have expected a video calling thing to ever come to fruition with them. This is the same company that basically always disregards voice chat for user safety, unless you're an Animal Crossing player. Ah, uh, I love Nintendo. Putting out microphones for £25 that virtually nothing supports, all with terrible quality. Marvelous. There's even an indie call animation that's quite neat. Strangely enough, I can say the Wii U chat is one of the main reasons why I started talking to a good friend of mine in the first place. Me and him ended up video calling on this randomly and since then have been good friends, with him even being a part of my most viewed Twitch clip of us playing Animal Crossing together. Let me show you how this is done. Give me that shit back! Like, get this fucking thing! You're, oh, you're that's a big one. Yeah, okay. No. That, that's a big one. I swear to God, if you get the tuna, I'm done. That's how you do it. That's how you do it, son. Oh my god. I told you, Papa gonna tell you it was done. Next up, we have the internet app on the Wii U, and look at that. It's actually not hidden like the Switch one is. I can't tell you why the Switch doesn't have this, but the 3DS and Wii U do. Sadly, this app runs like ass and crashes the majority of the time. The only thing I like is the fact they have a privacy mode in case your mom walks in on you watching pork videos on YouTube like every 13-year-old once did. Your Mii even will show up and start to dance and do other random stuff. There's even a YouTube app for the Wii U. I'm not even surprised. Don't know why I would even be surprised anymore. Then there's the daily log, and this has logs of all the times you played your Wii U, and boy, there was a huge gap for me. Something that was brought over from the Wii makes its return, and it's the Mii Maker. Uh, oh shit, don't, don't look Nintendo, fuck. The Mii Maker is basically a more streamlined and touched up version of the old one with the newest addition to take pictures of faces with the Wii U camera on the gamepad and use that for templates for Miis. I hate everything about this. It's not as cool as you would think since you still need to try to pick the hair and other stuff to match the photo. The photo just changes the face of anything. On second thought, I love this shit. Speaking of stuff from the Wii, the Wii U features the full Wii menu and everything. You're now able to play Wii games on the HD system. There was rumors for a long time that the Wii U enhances games in some form, but it actually doesn't. In fact, the Wii U basically makes games blurrier and stretches them. There's a great video by Good Vibes Gaming that goes into detail on this that I won't really waste time explaining here, but to sum it up, games look blurrier and the Wii U can't do full range HD and only limited, making things look washed out. As someone who wouldn't care about this, you will still find this to be a fun, easy way to play Wii games. Something that I'm sure a lot of you didn't know. So if you don't have a sensor bar for the Wii menu, don't worry. The gamepad itself is a sensor bar. Crazy, but yeah, just point your Wii mode at it and it works. I really wish Nintendo would have said something about this anywhere at all in the system, but they don't. Lastly, we have the application called Amiibo Tap. This right here is my first time ever clicking this, so we're gonna learn what it is together. This app allows you to scan Amiibos and unlock three minute demos to classic NES and SNES games. You could then buy them off the eShop if you wanted, 
Issue being here is I have no idea where my amiibos are. I do own amiibo. Uh, I just have no fucking idea where any of my amiibo are. So the only ones I found were these. And before anyone freaks out, this thing is already fucked like really bad. Um, kind of just want to open it and dry them out. So fuck it. Was it a whoopsie no no? But here I found my other fucking amiibos. Um, so I mean, I have to open this one. So let's try this motherfucker out. Let's try out the Donkey Kong. Whoa! And like that, you're ready to game. So strangely enough, this is not just a three minute demo and then it ends. You're able to switch between eight different sections of the game and play those for three minutes. With Zelda 1, you can basically fight all the bosses in the game if you wanted. I also love that you get to hear the classic Amiibo thing that plays all the time in the commercials. I can't recall if they use this anymore or not in the newer commercials for Amiibos, but it kind of is nostalgic for me. This app would be pretty cool if you had a bunch of Amiibos and never bought these games, but since most of these are on the Switch now, thanks to the Nintendo Online, it's a really neat concept, but that's about it. Oh shit, Mario 1, let's go! Yeah, baby! Something that's really cool is if you were to transfer your Wii data to your Wii U, you get this animation of Pikmin bringing your data to the new system. But something most people aren't aware of is if you were to transfer your Wii U data to another Wii U, you get these robot guys instead, and I find these very cute and it reminded me a lot of Ellie Bit's character designs. Strangely enough, the animations that play are unique from each other. I didn't think Nintendo would have to put that much effort into something when the Pikmin one would have been fine, but I'm really glad they did. It was actually very hard to find footage of these robot guys since most people just uploaded the Pikmin version, and that was kind of really it. I didn't even know about this other scene until now. I did end up finding footage of this, so I'll put the link down below, but it's from this guy. It's pretty cool, it's worth at least checking out if you are interested in these guys. If there's one thing I remember for the Wii U that gives me a good old chuckle, a good old titter, a good old Kakinate. is whatever the hell the USA marketing team was doing for the Wii U. These were terrible. You wonder why the Wii U sold badly? Because half of the commercials couldn't even convince the American masses that the Wii U was even a new system. Show the system off. Show what it can do. Not just the gamepad. Don't get me started on the game as Yoshi Exploshi. Would you feel guilty if you jerked off a Splatoon porn? They're children. They're not children. They are. They're kids. Have you jerked off to... Have you jerked off to fucking Splatoon porn? I think the worst thing they could have done in these commercials is say the Wii U was an upgrade. I legit see why people saw these commercials and even with commercial mocking parents who say they already have a Wii and still didn't think it was a new system. Not even the Xbox Series S had this issue in marketing, and that system is just a better Xbox One. That is more of an upgrade than the Wii U was. My favorite commercial to this day they ever made was the Amiibo ad where this kid gets beaten so bad, he goes out of his way to buy an Amiibo, and at this time when the commercial was out, people were just mad because no store looked like this with Amiibos. Amiibos were understocked for months, and this commercial made it seem like it was as simple as walking into a store. This kid does a whole montage of training with the amiibo, and it's just so bad. My favorite line is this. DK's in, this is gonna be bananas. This was written by people who never even played games in a lobby with other gamers. You're just mad because I'll be able to do something with my fucking guitar and hands that you'll never be able to achieve in your entire life, kid. So yeah, you're gay. <laughs> Also, this is Joe Kiri from Stranger Things, for anyone who cares about that detail. As much as this was hated on for being stupid, I really love the US marketing and how bizarre it started to get. I'm not saying at all of these were good ads, but damn were they memorable. Look man, all I'm saying is, I still quote the DK banana quote at least twice every year. And even with the failure of the marketing and everything else going on revolving around the Wii U, there's quite a lot of interesting games that came to the system, with a lot of the hard-hitting ones being ported over to the Switch for $60, 
But hey, you got a new funky mode. This was a system where we saw franchises returning that no one ever thought would, like Fatal Frame series with the game coming out for the Wii U that never got a physical release in America, but did in Japan. Even a new Star Fox game. I said, even a new Star Fox game. We even got a HD ports of Yakuza 1 and 2, or I should say Japan got HD ports. Japan actually got some really neat exclusive games over there. Had a Taiko Drum Master game, had Buddha Metal, a pig puzzle game that really looked cute. They even got their own version of Quop with a Roo Crash, where you control a dinosaur skeleton and move its legs so it doesn't fall over. The coolest in my opinion is the game Gotuchi Tetsudo. Look dude, it's a board game where you go around trying to get as many Japanese mascots from the provinces like Melon Bear, who I actually saw when I went to Japan back in 2015. It's such a Japanese game and I love it for that. The weirdest Japanese game that I think that they got was this Yokai Watch Just Dance game. Not a crossover I expected, but that's Yokai Watch for you. They'd always be doing weird shit. But I love Yokai Watch for that reason. So with the support of the new eShop, which was a blast to visit since it was the Wii Shop, but on crack, giving us so many virtual console games and random indie games. It was such a treat to always shop here, and I loved even during holiday, the music would fit the theme for the eShop. Why don't we go ahead and visit the eShop right now and see what's going on. Should I even be surprised? Sadly, Nintendo has shut the service down for the Wii U and 3DS, making whatever was on here not available by non-pirating means. Speaking of pirating, man, look man, don't tell Nintendo this, but with jailbreaking, you can finally make the Wii U be the system it was meant to be by having it work with GameCube Wii and Wii U. Plus being able to download these games that are now lost forever for maybe free. You can also play Japanese exclusive Wii U titles and all kinds of emulators to boot. The most important thing of all, you can play Flappy Bird on your Wii U. Just don't do this and take your Wii U to Japan. Being caught with a hacked system there can result in five years of prison time since it is illegal to do this over there. I don't usually condone piracy, but all I'm gonna say is this. There's no real way to get these anymore unless you buy hard copies and boy. Ooh boy. Well, I thought to myself, why not take a look at the Wii U games I acquired over the years of owning my system and talk about them. These won't be in-depth reviews, but just enough to get a good idea of the game and all that fun stuff. So with that, let's jump right into the Wii U discs themselves. To this day, these discs feel so weird, but a good weird. You see, the edges on the disc are rounded, so they have these really smooth feel to them. It's quite hard to explain unless you own a game for yourself but it's worth it to just touch the disc if you haven't. I did also try to see why they made a disc like this and no one really knows for sure why. It's probably for piracy protection, like how the GameCube discs were small and that was like the big piracy protection thing they had. So with this, they have the rounded edges for, you know, protecting against piracy, which not really doing a good job apparently. But I think now let's go ahead and dive into our first game that we're looking at for today. And this was a game that came bundled with the Wii U. That game being none other. Man, I miss when you clicked on the game to have it just launch into a splash screen to then seamlessly transition into the actual game. It really adds to the whole experience of just sitting down to play a game you just bought. So here's Nintendo Land. Nintendo Land is a mini game compilation with the whole premise being you stumbled onto your own amusement park as a Mario block falls from the sky and a voice can be heard asking to be let out. Once you touch the box, out pops this robot that tells you her name is Monita, welcoming you to Nintendo Land. She goes over the controls, then gives you another box, and then boom, a giant tower appears to then open the park. We get to head up onto the tower as the endless skies can be seen for miles. Monita then grants us with the attractions we can play here as there's 12 of them. I'll go over, but before we do, I really forgot how much Nintendo went ham here with the bloom. Everything is so bright, it has a very weird dreamlike look to it. I personally remember it looking way better though, but I'm also just not that big of a fan of bloom. 
I do love walking around the park to see all the random me's walking around, exploring the attractions, with some even entering or leaving them. When you walk near the gates, you can even hear music playing corresponding to that series. There's just so many little details here, and man, I remember why this got a lot of playtime when I got my Wii U. Mostly because it was also the only game I had for months, so that also probably helped it with the playtime. Back to the 12 different attractions, with 9 of them being playable with one person, while 3 of them needs a second player. It's a really interesting selection of minigames based off franchises from Nintendo's history. Like we have the obvious picks like Mario and Zelda, and then we got F-Zero, Game & Watch, Balloon Fight, and even a game based off a Japanese-only NES game called Nazo no Murasame Joel. And man, this box art goes hard. The first game we'll be starting off is a Pikmin game, and what do you know, it looks like I'll finally be playing a real Pikmin game from Nintendo themselves this time, because this game was actually made by Nintendo and not some like third party developer. This game has you taking control of you and a CPU friend dressed up as Olimar and a Pikmin. Your goal is to stop Dark Monita who has committed several war crimes and famines. This game is very simple and feels more like if Mario and Pikmin combined a game together. You get little Pikmin to throw out a break stuff while getting nectar. There's not much thought into puzzles or bringing stuff back to a pod, it's more along the lines of an action adventure game just fighting enemies and traversing the level. I also watched my CPU buddy get turned into poop. The next one is the Zelda one and this is probably my favorite. Sadly this is way better to play if you have a Wiimote since the gamepad only gives you access to the bow and arrow while the Wiimote gives you a sword. I also don't have a working Wiimote so I couldn't get footage of the sword gameplay but I'll go ahead and still show some gameplay footage of it. As for the bow and arrow, this is a whole gameplay having you aim with the gamepad while the screen sees this as your perspective. It's fun, but nothing beats picking up that Wiimote and swinging like your life depends on it. It's obvious the gameplay for the sword was taken from the Wii Sports Resort mode that plays very similar to this, just with this expanding on the premise more. And when I say expanded, I mean expanded. This whole mode would take you around an hour to complete, with 14 levels of playthrough with them all looking so unique, even having bosses to boot and a final showdown with Ganon. This game is also quite challenging to play through. I've seen many, many players struggle with this game mode and don't think you can just have three friends come on and cheese this and make it an easier time to play because with multiple players comes the drawback of you all sharing the same health bar. But if you're in for a challenging Zelda adventure, this right here really hits the mark. Well, would you look at that? We finally have a new Metroid game. This joke would have been a lot funnier during the uh, Nintendo Land release, trust me. The game has you fighting waves of enemies with two different ways to play. Either you can fly around in Samus's ship, or you can fight on the ground as Samus. The ship ends up being the most broken thing you can use, because you can charge these missiles and the blast range on them is just insane. What the fuck? Okay, what the fuck was that? That's a rocket I can shoot. That wasn't even a fucking rocket, that was a shockwave. Yeah, seriously! <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you that the ship is not broken, because it is. Strangely enough, the ship controls feel pretty similar to Star Fox Zero's controls. I'm not saying that this game was probably another big reason why Miyamoto thought the control scheme could work. But there's quite a lot of similarities between the two games, since you even use the gamepad to shoot while looking at the TV to see your surroundings. You're also able to still move around and do whatever as the cutscenes play, just like in Star Fox Zero. If my theory is true somehow, I could honestly see why Miyamoto would have thought these controls could have worked. Because it doesn't really feel that tedious to look up at the TV and then look down at the gamepad to shoot. But the reason why these controls don't work is because one is a room with enemies and is very slow paced, giving you plenty of time to aim and shoot, while the other has shit like this happening. Is this probably not the level to go to, though, if you're just now playing this after, like, how many fucking years? Dead, we're dead. Come on, get out of there. Get out of there. <laughs> God damn it, dude. Luckily for me, I have footage of this game from an 8 year old Let's Play video, so it's time to show off the battle mode. You and a friend can duke it out on 5 stages as either you both are on foot, or one person flies while the other runs around. Even has items you can pick up and use. Like I said before, the ship is very one sided if you're going to use this. The ship can just aim wherever with missiles, and there's not much the ground character can do. The ground character can charge their blaster, but it shoots a really horrible bomb that goes at an arc. You'll probably never hit the ship with this. But the ground character can turn into a morph ball, giving him some mobility, but again, the ship is still faster, so it doesn't really matter all that much. 
Aiming as the person is also horrible since you have to hold the A button while relying on the Wiimote's horrible motion controls. But there's also some stages that have gimmicks like these grappling hooks that you can use to shoot up to higher areas, but I would advise that if you want a fair fight, just don't challenge the ship as a person, ever. Besides that, mission mode for single player is the other option you have. It's fun, but not really my thing. The next minigame is Mario Chase. As you play as Mario while the person on the TV is playing as Toad to catch you with two robot Yoshis that will give hints at where Mario is hiding while you try to find him. The music for this is Mario 3 music and man, I love Mario 3 music. This game can be so fun, but it's sadly one of the three games that need a second player. The maps also don't provide that much differences besides terrain hazards like mud. The gamepad player will also have their face on the screen the whole time, so enjoy me and high school at 480p quality. A little detail I like is if you run through mud you get covered and there's even a power star Mario can grab to knock Toad around. The Yoshis will try their best to knock Mario over, but they can sometimes get in the way of you winning. After each match, you do get a play-by-play -play map to see what you all did during the match, and I love this little detail. It just kind of gives you a whole little, like, bird's eye view of everything, and it's, it's really cute. I like it. This is probably my favorite attraction to play with friends if anyone ever comes over and just wants to play Nintendo Land. Sweet Day is here, and this game is the second game you need friends to play with, requiring you to either use the gamepad or Wiimote. There's only two maps here with the person playing on screen using the Wiimote as you run around collecting candy while the guards are controlled with both control sticks on the gamepad, and you can use them to capture the criminal. There's some strategy to this because you have the option to collect as many candies at once to get more into the holes with the downside of you becoming heavier. Or be like me and just pick up three every time and drop them into the hole. There's no real penalty to picking up three since you don't really become heavier, so this ends up being the best strat for me. It's kind of crazy to me that this was the only Animal Crossing game that we had on the Wii U technically until Amiibo Festival came out. I'll give Nintendo credit, they had a good start at least. The costumes you get here are just so adorable and they're really cool representations of Animal Crossing characters, but the only downside to this is there's only two maps and they feel very similar. They're still nice looking maps with many Animal Crossing details, but I'm sure most of you couldn't tell the difference between the two maps if I showed you. The final attraction that needs two players is the Luigi's Mansion minigame that allows the gamepad user to play as the ghost while the TV player gets to be the green bean himself. The ghost player at all times is invisible while Luigi and the robot AI try to move around to flash you. The little lights on the robot's head will even light up to show if you're closer or far away from them, so really rely heavily on the hints. The ghost can only be seen if he gets hit with the flashlight or is in a location that gets lit up from the lightning flash. The ghost player can bait the Luigi player by revealing himself, but I wouldn't recommend it. Your goal as the ghost player is to sneak up and grab Luigi three times to take him out, while Luigi has to use the flashlight to drain the ghost's health down to zero, but you can also run out of power if you don't manage to pick up batteries scattered everywhere. You can even pick up the battery that makes your flashlight extremely powerful. There's five maps, but they do feel very samey, but not surprised on this one since it makes sense here with how the maps are supposed to be designed. There are some stages that do set themselves apart with some having objects that will light up or do little things if the ghost is nearby to let you know. A good example are these night armors, and their eyes will flash whenever the ghost is nearby. The Wiimote will also vibrate to show if the ghost player is nearby, giving a weird sense of tension. And I say tension because apparently this ghost is so scary that when he catches you, you just die after three times of this. Now it's time for the solo attractions, and these should be pretty quick to explain. First up is Yoshi's Fruit Cart, and the goal is to draw a line on the gamepad to guide Yoshi to the fruit to eat, and then leave out the door. The fruit can be seen on the TV, while on the gamepad the fruits aren't there, making it a little more challenging. If you're not careful, you can even run out of the line power, so make sure your lines are short but on point. If you're wondering, the game does kind of get challenging with some maps having fruits moving in circles or having an order you have to get, but it's not really that special. Out of all the single attractions, this is probably the most forgettable one for me. Octopus Dance is the next attraction and feels like a neat Space Channel 5 clone with you copying the moves and reactions on beat instead of pushing buttons on screen to a beat. Also, this one uses the webcam, so enjoy high school me again. This can get pretty challenging to the point if you lose enough, the octopus takes you out back, and that's basically all this has to offer. Donkey Kong's Crash Course is next, and this is the hardest minigame for me in the whole collection. The course is very long and requires timing, and make sure you don't just rush in and die, because I do that a lot, and this is why this one is so hard for me, because I just cannot slow down. It's a fun distraction with it giving some interesting looking puzzles, and even having you blow into the mic to raise platforms. It's just not one for me, and I don't usually come back to it. The minigame based off Balloon Trip, 
floats on in, and you use the wind to guide him to hit balloons for points while avoiding the enemies or falling into the water to avoid being eaten by the giant fish. One of the more relaxing minigames in this collection, with some levels even having different times of day and weather, like rain. I don't have much to complain about this one, it's just not that interesting, but it also isn't that bad either. Captain's Falcon Twister Race is the only time Nintendo will pretend F-Zero is a franchise people want. I don't like this one because you have to look at yourself playing this the whole time. The goal is to race down the track and pass each goal line before time runs out while avoiding road hazards and crashing. Besides the few huge jump moments, that's all there is to this game. There's 12 areas to beat with the only thing really changing between them is road hazards. For whatever reason, the star power from Mario's in this too. So, cool. Takamaru's Ninja Castle is next, and it's a fun on-rail shooter using the gamepad to shoot out those cool weapons from the hit anime, Boruto. It's a fun time, and I love the nice paper aesthetic to everything. It does get really hard in the later levels, with some ninjas even shooting back at you. This game is a fun distraction, but it's not one that I come back to all that much, because you have to turn the gamepad on its side, and doing this makes the gamepad really heavy and lopsided, and it's hard to aim with just one hand. With that, all the attractions are covered, so what do you get for doing all this? You get coins to spend for the tower minigame to unlock prizes for the park. The journey is sometimes more important than the destination. That was Nintendo Land, so let's keep going and dive into the other Wii U games I own. Super Mario Maker is a game I wanted to love, but I never really got into it as much as other people did. One of the cool things though about Mario 1 is I still have my copy and it came with this neat little art book that has some really cool drawings and ideas for levels. I really do like the idea of Mario Maker because it allows players to have levels made from 4 different Mario games like Mario 1, Mario 3, and Mario World, and then the new Super Mario games, with all the quirks that come with those games as well. At first, I was loving the game, but a few months later, I kind of started just to hate this. And it's because the game went from having levels designed to be fun and interesting, to basically all the user made stages at the top rakes consisting of just really hard levels, auto runners or hold right stages, or even levels that only were made to troll the player, or in worst cases the stages that had one rule to play them and that was to not touch anything. Don't get me wrong, these levels probably took hours to get working and are super cool the first time, even the second time for sure, maybe the third and fourth time. But when you've seen the top levels be nothing but these types of levels, you start to feel the game is treating you like a three-year-old being forced to watch Coco Melon. From what my chat said, it's basically a baby sensory level at this point. I know there's this whole aspect of building your own levels, but I also never dived much into that since I just didn't care to make levels for this. But something I really did care about was the amiibo costumes you could unlock from the likes of Hello Kitty, Starfy, even Bulbasaur. The amount of costumes felt endless and weird to see, but man, it felt so cool seeing Kirby, Tingle, Chibi Robo, and even anime girls? Bro, based in anime pilled? It's something I felt Mario Maker 2 lost a lot of charm not including. There was also challenges you could do like 100 Man Mario and 10 Man Mario having you beat the stages randomly selected with only a few lives, but in 2023, the online features were removed, meaning you can't upload any levels made for others to play. But now the game gives off a really neat time capsule feeling, seeing levels from 2015 here just left a time. Over time, the fans for this game were able to get fan servers up and running, allowing players to make levels in 2023 for the first time after the closure of the online services. There's something weird though, the fact that I can still recommend the first game, even with a lot of the features not even working, and still stays comparable to the second game, it really does show how well made this one was. And you can probably get this game for like 15 bucks now, and there's still so many levels you can play even if you can't upload your own creations. But that's Mario Maker, a game that many people have fond memories of, but a game that allows me to play an actual good Star Fox game. Star Fox Zero single-handedly killed the franchise for good, and it's all this man's fault for wanting control is that I've seen gamers compared to the act of being raped. Jesus. Quite a reach, but hey, you do you. 
I really do think that this was supposed to be such a big deal for Nintendo, because they even came out showing a full animated episode of our beloved Star Fox crew and a bunch of other neat advertisements. Which with all that support you would wonder why it failed, but there's actually a few simple reasons for why it did. The first reason why it failed was because it was a retreading of a game that was a retread of the first game that also just had a 3DS remake come out to then give us a strange remake of a remake. This game just comes off as really safe and tried too hard to be Star Fox 64, but with portals. The second reason was the weird ass controls. The game requires you to aim and shoot with the gamepad while the TV shows your surroundings. They were trying to go for this whole idea of you being the pilot in the cockpit, and I get it, but the game ends up being you looking down at the gamepad and back up at the TV over and over frantically trying to manage everything. If you were to look at the TV and shoot, your aim will be pretty off, but if you were to look at the gamepad and shoot, your field of view is so small, you will run into everything a lot. You can put the gamepad screen on the TV, but then you're playing the whole game like this and the issue still isn't fixed. The third issue was the fact that they had a lot of ideas for this, but nothing ever feels fleshed out. A good example is this little slow spaceship that they have that you use for stealth missions, because why would I not want to play a stealth mission in a, you know, a fucking Star Fox game? While I'm personally a mixed on this, I do understand fully why lots of people just hated this mission and didn't want to do it. And even the game doesn't really want you to do it because later on you can just come back to this place with a normal R wing and the whole level is so much better. This game also was a bitch to record for whatever reason the voices and a good amount of sound effects will only come through the gamepad. And if you were to try to plug something into the headphone port to get audio from that, the game will be muted on anything else that isn't the gamepad. There is a workaround to get audio from the gamepad and audio from the TV to be together, but if you don't know that workaround you basically had to do this for footage. Oh shit, get out of there. It was either that or pure silence from the characters. Now in 2023, I've had a lot of time to reflect on this game, and man, do I still love the shit out of this game. I'm sorry, but even with the controls, once you get used to them, this still feels like a pretty good Star Fox game. I may be one of the few, but I stand by that this game is just downright beautiful. Even if it was heavily criticized for looking like a Dreamcast game when it came out, I do feel because of that, the direction that they took made this game age really well graphically. The nice lighting in the darker areas with the amount of things on screen and the game still runs really well. And a really cool thing is after a while of playing, I was able to kind of get the idea of where my reticle was while looking at the TV, letting me aim a little more accurately so I didn't have to look down so much. While some stages are just remade stages of Star Fox 64 stages, I do feel that there are some good stages here that feel like their own thing. A few good examples are Sector B where you join the Cornera army and Bill and an all out war while you fly through an enemy shield of a ship to go inside to disarm it. Which then results in a mad dash to exit before the Corneria ship shoots their giant cannon and blows it up. Or this level that has you flying at max speed dodging craters and debris as it's a shortcut to Venom. Another praise I have for this game is just how spectacle the bosses are in this. With these huge bosses that require you to dodge all of their attacks to take them out. I even love how some bosses have multiple ways of taking them out, giving the player options for making fights easier or even harder. There's even this cool slow-mo effect that happens if you fly into Star Wolf whenever they show up, and this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. See that's so- oh my god it's so fucking cool I love that shit! At the end of the day, this game still holds a special place, but I also never care to come back to this game over the other games like Adventure or Assault. I also got Star Fox Guard, and there's a frog called Grippy, and that's all I needed to know. I also opened my copy, so now I'm out 1450. Thanks. No, no, my poor mining base. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> okay. It's time to cover the new Black Sheep of the Smash series, the one and only Smash 4. To put in perspective just how hype I was for this game, I remember when the Smash 4 demo was going around, I had my mom take me and my friend to try the 3DS and Wii U version of the game. And here's the footage of that. Man. I was playing so well. I literally remember during when this was happening and I kept falling off the stage. I just had no idea how to recover. So a lot of time if you watch me because I was playing the Mega Man here, I would fall off and have no idea what to do and just die. When it came to the 3DS demo, I tried out Smash Run and Greninja, but I don't have footage of this. After this, the 3DS demo was announced for only a select few people and I sadly was not one of them. So my friend and I just bought the demo codes off eBay for like 20 bucks for both. 
Now, Smash 4 is one of those games that I personally don't think is as bad as everyone says. I know as Ultimate came out, it really did blow Smash 4 out of the water to reveal its flaws, and it really did not help Smash 4's case when the 3DS version had to be similar, and it hurt the Wii U version having to cut characters and other things like that. Then you have the issue with how the 3DS version got Smash Run, a fun and exciting game mode having you killing iconic Nintendo creatures while you run around this giant landscape to power your character up for a battle or an event at the end. The Wii U, however, got Smash Tour. But I'm here to look back at Smash 4 and how it had some really great things to offer. Starting with the one thing Smash 4 has over Ultimate is the trophy collection, and man, I love these way more than Spirits. The amount of details on the trophies and how there's a good mix of obscure characters and well-known characters is always great to look through. The trophies even have a lot of nice info about the characters like the games they're from and the text having these little lore dumps, which is something Spirits lack. While it's easier to add Spirits into the game as time goes on, these trophies will still hold way more value as time goes on. The trophy shop is a nice touch making it feel like you're going to the store to buy amiibos of these characters. It even feels like a real shop as some trophies will be discounted. If you're not sold on this, just tell me. Does this not feel so amazing to look at? I really got a blast of nostalgia from viewing my fighter records as I haven't touched this game in years, with almost having over 2000 KOs with my main Pac-Man. With over 400 hours, it's safe to say I played the game to the end of time. This was also the second game to feature Stage Builder, and while it's still very bare bones here, it did have more charm than the Brawl one. One of my favorite stages to make was the basketball stages and play Smash Ball, which here's some old footage of that when I did a Let's Play on it. I do want to address Smash Tour, and I do think it was treated unfairly. I don't think Smash Tour is as bad as everyone says it is. It's not better than Smash Run, trust me. But to say this game is really bad because it's not Smash Run isn't fair. Smash Tour feels more like a very fast-paced Mario Party game. Everyone moves at once and you get trophies as boosts to help in battle or affect the board. You're also able to pick up characters scattered across the board and even win them for winning fights. There's still even some Smash Run elements here with you picking up boosting items to help build your character to be super powerful for the ending fight. There's even a nice risk versus reward because you can lose characters or gain characters for winning or losing the little fights you can do with other players. So there's actual incentive to win these fights. It's a shame you can't pick what characters fight, but with the items you can acquire, being able to swap the characters orders or other things like that, meaning the items that you acquire are important because they can give you a better advantage or ruin your opponent's lead if you had no way of winning before. Giving some strategy on what items and trophies should you use or keep for later meaning that if there's a certain trophy on the field that you know you really need, now your whole game plan is how do I get over there. There's a lot of neat random gimmicks that can happen like Ridley joining and you having to beat him for a huge stat boost or the field being covered in smoke to block your view. To say that this mode can't be hectic or fun is a lie since the randomness can keep you on your toes. I also don't mind the items being here since it makes it where even with low stats you can have an advantage for the fights. I do wish there was an option to turn them off, but that's also the competitive player in me talking but I don't really mind them. You have three boards to pick from, and I feel the medium board is the perfect size since you're still close to everyone but won't be running into people every turn. I do like for the final fight, whatever characters you acquired end up being each of your stocks, making stockpiling characters be a big advantage for the fight. And I do like that the trophies now have a purpose, makes the trophies not only worth collecting, but now you have a reason to use them in the game. So next time you have some friends over, I say give Smash 4 a try. You may like it again after all these years. There's also 8 player Smash, it's awful to play and I never cared for this past it being interesting to try once. Special Battle is something I did a lot, it can make some of the dumbest fights to ever exist and I love it for that reason. I do feel as well this game has a healthy option of single player content like event matches being interesting and man, there's a lot of them. These usually just consist of fights with weird rules or effects to them. Then there's Master Orders where you do a fight for a prize and get 3 different prize pool options to choose from. This can help you get trophies or other things you still need. Crazy Order is where the boys become men, with being able to do the three prize pool thing, but keeping it going to the end. Then having the final fight be a fight with Crazy Hand. If you end up losing before finishing, you lose everything you acquired, giving a huge risk versus reward. This is my usual go-to mode to play out of these two. Stadium does come back and has a new form of target test, but this time it's Angry Birds. Strangely enough, I don't hate this, and it can be quite exciting seeing how much damage you can cause in two turns. Multi-Man Smash also makes a return with all the modes you're used to, but it does have a new mode now called Rival Smash, which has you and the same character controlled by a CPU trying to kill more Miis than you. 
there's just not much to this, and I never cared for this even in the other games. Home Run Contest smashes its way in again, and what can I say that hasn't already been said? It's the best feeling ever to send this man flying. So long, sandbag, we will miss you. Not stinky! All-Star mode is still good, unlike an ultimate, and the rest area is just as beautiful as ever. Finally, the biggest different mode is classic mode, this time having you fight in an arena as you plan your route to pick which trophies you duke it out with. With it finishing off with an original boss that to this day, I've never been able to beat properly. But that's everything worth talking about, and playing through Smash 4 again made me realize how slow this game feels, but also how good it feels at the same time. Best way I can put it is you're playing in zero gravity compared to Ultimate, but it still somehow feels natural after all these years. The first time I ever saw Wind Waker, I instantly fell in love with it. I remember watching my cousins play this game at my grandma's house, just exploring Outset Island and seeing how colorful and expressive Link was. Had to have been the coolest thing for me, since going from Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time, with Link just doing this face for a majority of the game, it felt so advanced to look at Link just existing. I really felt he was more than a character I was meant to put myself into, he was now a character that I was tagging along with to see the adventure till the very end. I eventually did beat Wind Waker after a year of it being out. Four months of that year was me being stuck trying to get into the pirate ship with a password because guess who forgot it? I remember feeling so happy and also quite sad that I never would get to experience this game for the first time again when I beat it. After that, I kinda didn't touch the game. I moved back to Majora's Mask and the other titles I owned. I did wonder when I would revisit the game again, but soon I didn't have to wonder anymore. Nine years ago, this trailer was shown at E3, and out of all the Zelda games to get remade, somehow the one that still looks timeless to this day got the remake treatment. Wind Waker HD was announced, and to say I was excited was an understatement. I remember just keeping up with any news video I could about the game. And then seeing these like early screenshots that people would just go into like 40 minute videos talking about. Dude, I watched so many of these videos where they were just analyzing these pictures for like 40, 50 minutes, man. Just so many hours wasted just to be told the same fucking thing over and over. It's also really crazy to see the reception this version had compared to its original. With this review saying the game looked on par with Pixar which is such a huge change from the reviews from the OG release seeing how it was a baby game and that Nintendo needed to make more dark and edgy games. You were teased at Space World 2000. You were frustrated by Wind Waker. Yeah! So get ready to shut your whiny fanboy mouth. Now we're literally saying Wind Waker looks like Pixar. That's, that's literally crazy. I remember on the day that Wind Waker HD came out, I wasn't able to go to GameStop to get the game. So I begged my friend's dad to let me give him my money that I had to buy the game with his credit card. Since I was staying the night at my friend's house, I couldn't just do it, you know, with my mom's card. He did end up actually buying it for me and I gave him the money. But now looking back on it, that was kind of such a dick move for asking him to do that. I could have just waited. But I was finally able to play the game I remembered fondly, but in HD. Till I realized my friend didn't even have an HD TV in his house. So I played Wind Waker HD in 480p. And what's even worse, his TV was broken. So the display on it had like messed up colors and like it was staticky. And somehow I still was loving the game and just in awe by it. I soon played the game on a natural working HD TV when I got home. And man, to say this game was stunning is exactly what I would still say nine years later. Even if some areas the bloom is a little too much, I still think it's such a nice addition to the game. I even remember doing a let's play on the game but never finishing it, which I still to this day have never finished Wind Waker HD. And I kind of realized something. As much as I was hyped for this game, I personally found it very hard to go back to. The game isn't bad whatsoever and easily is my top third favorite, but it just didn't hit the same as it did when I was younger. I always find myself wanting to replay this game so bad but then I always seem to stop right before Tower of Gods. I guess my sense of wonder for this game just isn't really there anymore, but as I replayed this to get footage, I realized just how much detail and small things are in this. I believe before Breath of the Wild, this was the only Zelda game where you could use enemies' weapons against them, or for puzzles, which Dragon Roost Island does a lot. 
Playing through this dungeon was a nice refresher to why Wind Waker has such unique mechanics. All the rope cutting puzzles, the throwing water and using enemies to press switches, or siddle. I thought this was a bad translation error for so long, but this is an actual word which literally just means to do what he's doing. If there's one thing that Wind Waker has over Twilight Princess is the fact that the game can be cinematic while still having really nice design bosses. It really was a nice little revisit for this video, but I think now it's time to set sail. While I may not hold the same sense of wonder for this game as I did as a child, I can still say Wind Waker will always hold a special place in my heart. I took pictures apparently. Let's see what I what what pictures I took. What did I take? Okay. Okay. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Why did I take a picture of this man just fucking captured? Can you explain? Dude, I, I was doing this shit back in 2015. You think I have an ex explanation for this shit? <laughs> no, dude. I don't know why the fuck that man's captured. Please. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse is the only Kirby game that ever came out for the Wii U and like Wind Waker, I never beat it. Even to this day, I felt really bad I never did because this was one of the games my mom bought me during when our relationship wasn't the best. She was always working while I was home a lot by myself, technically. In a way, it felt like this was her way of showing me she still loved me while trying to make me happy for her being gone a lot. And I think that's why I felt so bad never beating it. I got all the way to the final boss and just never finished it. I couldn't remember why, but now that I have to do this game for the video, why not do what my child self couldn't do? If you never heard of Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, it's the sequel to Canvas Curse. It's that DS game with the finger in the commercial. Right off the bat, this game feels like an HD DS game since you control the whole game by touching the screen to draw lines for Kirby to traverse since he can't just walk in the game. This sadly doesn't always work well and it feels pretty dated. Which honestly makes me really sad, because this game is just outright beautiful with the clay art design to everything and all the charm from Kirby and the enemies. But it's hard to enjoy all the great textures and design from the game when most of your time playing will be looking down at the gamepad. You can look at the TV, but good luck trying to accurately figure out your positioning on the map. It's something you can get used to while playing, and when the game isn't requiring you to make drastic maneuvers and allows you to tackle the levels at a nice slow pace, this game feels really good. I love being able to launch Kirby off like a missile after collecting 100 stars and being able to get places that you couldn't before. The variety of the levels in the game is nice, and like I said before, just assume every stage looks great because they do. Strangely enough, this game gives me a lot of Yoshi Island vibes, just this game plays a lot worse than that. There's even transformations too, and I think that's also what really helps sell it as a Yoshi's Island kind of feel. One of my favorite things in the game are the collectibles, with them being these clay figures that give off amiibo vibes. They're also all displayed in this little nice comfy room, giving the sense that you, the player, just got done making these. No surprise, but this is another Kirby game with charm just oozing everywhere. But I think it's now time to finish what I started all those years back. The final boss. I now realized why I never beat this game. The boss is fucking hard. It's two bosses in one. The clown cloud, and then the controls. Trying to dodge all of his attacks is the worst because he never stops shooting. But with determination, I finally pulled through and beat him. Finally getting rid of that guilt I felt for so long. And I was asked by chat, was it worth it? No. No, not at all. Sonic Boom. Why was I so excited for this game after seeing the ads with dubstep? I really wanted this game to be good, man. I remember not minding the changes to the characters, but we all know how that went. Look, I'm just gonna get straight to the point. The game runs like shit, controls fine, and looks like shit as soon as you step out of the forest. The glitches are also crazy good, like the flying knuckles glitch that I used to skip a good amount of the game, but there's not much I can say that hasn't been said before. The biggest thing that I really do feel this game suffers with is that it's boring and quite repetitive. I ended up figuring this out pretty fast when the game had me do the same puzzle four times. 
I would never say though that this is the worst game ever. Like if I was forced to get through this, I could pretty easily. Because trust me, when you played Hotel Transylvania 3, this game looks like a AAA experience next to that. And I'll give it credit, there was a little joke that Atsy liked, so I mean, this game has that over Hotel Transylvania 3. That game never made me laugh. It only made me cry a lot. I hate Hotel Transylvania 3. Do not ever play that shit. It sucks. Mario 3D World was a game I remember being excited for, and then I never beat it till the Switch release for a stream. I don't really know why I didn't finish it, but I think it was because maybe I was waiting for a real 3D Mario experience and this game just wasn't it. I also just finished beating 3D Land not that long ago before this, so I was quite tired of this type of gameplay. But after not playing this for a while, this game feels really good. The fact you can finally play as Peach and it's not her crying and looking for an item called the Vibe Scepter that the game tells you your mom probably uses in her room. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> It's just nice she has an actual good representation this time. She also makes the game 10 times easier for my awful platforming skills because she can float. Obviously with the Switch version of the game being out, there's not really any reason to ever come back to this version. It really does also make the game feel so bloated with collectibles now that Miiverse is gone. Like yeah, I could get these stamps, but now I have to ask myself why. This is also the game that debuted the cat suit, or to our viewers of the Mario movie, the costume to appeal to the furry community. I mean, not like he hasn't been doing that since Super Mario Land 2 or Super Mario Bros. 3. The cat suit is great and it helps the devs really make these levels quite vertical, which is new for these types of Mario games. I'm also going to give the game props here for experimenting with power-ups like the Double Cherries or the Ice Skate Boot. They're really weird, but I like them. You can also rob Goombas for coins by rubbing them. The game's perfect and I can see why even when I streamed the Switch version, I just loved it, man. Pokemon Tournament was the strangest spin-off we got in some time. A Pokemon Tekken clone that was first shown off with these early leaked screenshots of Blaziken and Lucario. This really made everyone go crazy wondering what it could be or if it was a new mainline game. We now know it's that Pokemon game that lasted a year or two before no one cared. Personally, I kinda get why this game died, especially for the comp players. The game barely got any updates to nerf or buff characters, meaning some Pokemon were broken and never really got dealt with. And while the arcade version was getting new characters, the console players would have to wait till 2015 when we got them. And a port of the game for $60. And then more DLC characters were added. By this point, no one cared and these characters now aren't going to save the game. That being said, I did play this competitively at Otaku Cafe, which I've talked about before if you're interested in seeing more of this place. I played Chandelure, who has a grab like this. Strangely enough, he is not the most broken character in the game. I used to come in top 5 when I would play and maybe that sounds impressive until you realize on the best day for this game we got maybe 15 people. Most of the time it was like 8 to 10 people. To say the tournaments lasted would be a huge lie. I personally fell out after Star Fox Zero came out, but it was a fun time while it lasted. And I do remember that this guy was there that would always play Shadow Me Too, and he was really cool. I actually liked hanging out with him a lot. I think it's crazy, at this point most people know this game because of Twitch emotes, but I love it for what it tried to do. Even if the execution wasn't perfect, it was memorable. Also, the fucking music slaps. God damn. Sonic Lost Worlds is the first Wii U Sonic game we got. While most people are quick to call it a Mario Galaxy clone, I beg to differ. These levels do have some similar details to Mario Galaxy, but I actually feel like it's more like Final Fantasy XIII, since the level creators just love long hallways or tubes. This was the first Sonic game to ever give Sonic a dedicated run button, and while I don't hate this idea and I do feel it could work, I always forget to hold it down and die quite a lot. This is accompanied to the fact that Sonic feels like he has the gravity of the sun with how fast he drops out of jumps and how little you can control him in the air. Making simple platforming while having to hold a button and then press another one to jump is just annoying. The world map also is the most thrown together map I've ever seen. There's just tiles you can walk on for no reason making it more tedious to select levels than it needs to be. Like if you're gonna do the basic platforming unity package for your game from how it goes from grassland to desert and then has the basic world map just copy Mario. Like, why are you trying to get all spiffy with it when you could have just had a line here, line here, and been done with it? Would have been so much better. 
This is another thing that annoys me, and even Mario does it, but why do platformers recently love locking you out of progression if you don't have the required MacGuffins like green stars or flickies? It's not a collect-a-thon. Why should I be forced to halt progress because I didn't feel like getting the items you're forcing me to do? This stuff just makes me not want to play because I want to take the game at the pace I want and play the way I want, but the game is forcing me to treat it like it's something it's not. As much as I hated 100%ing Kirby 64 since doing so hinders the whole creativity of the powers, but at least that game doesn't lock you out of it if you don't do it. You may not get the real final boss, but you still get a satisfactory game experience even if you don't get the crystals. I don't have a lot of experience with the Wii U version, but I do have a lot of experience with the 3DS version and how it almost got me in trouble because if you played the special stages in that, you know the pain of having to move your whole body to complete them. I did that in a public high school and almost got in trouble for apparently taking pictures of a girl in my class. Sonic Lost World's 3DS almost got me in trouble because the game was poorly designed. Well, I can tell you a way to actually make the game quite enjoyable, and that's speedrunning the levels as fast as you can. The parkour system in this is actually well designed, and if you know how to use it, these levels can be quite fast. Anyone who tries to say the song Lost Rolls is too slow, just doesn't know how to take advantage of the movement. Any movement in 3D when it comes to knowing how to work the parkour with the level design really shows a good game is here. Then the 2D sections come in and the game is back to being bad. This was also the first Sonic game where we got a Nintendo crossover level and man, this is still amazing to this day with so many neat details and secrets. I don't want to spoil it, but it's sad that this level is forever locked on the Wii U. Then we even had a Yoshi Island level and while it's not as good as the Zelda stage, it still has charm. The Knights crossover though is just a reused boss rush fight with all the bosses in the game, but now they have Knights models with them. I wish they would have done more, but a man can dream. A night's dream. I'll fucking shoot myself, don't worry. Shovel Knight, the indie character thrown into everything back in the mid 2010s. While I personally have not played much of the game to say something that wouldn't have already been said, the game is peak NES throwback and I love it. Very Mega Man style to be as accurate as possible. This was also for the longest time the only way to play two players with Shovel Knight, thanks to the Shovel Knight amiibo. I really do like the game, but I just didn't spend much time playing it. But if you want a game with rewarding systems and a hard but mostly fair game experience, then this is the perfect game for you. You could say, it's the Dark Soul. The next game is one I've never played till this video right now, and it's a Pikmin clone with platinum features they're known for. I only remember that a demo was made for this that was so bad, people who actually bought the game just recommended not even trying the demo out. I personally didn't play through this that long, mostly through the intro part and a little of the second mission, but man, this game is full of high impact charm. This game wastes no time starting off with a bang and I love the designs of the characters and hey, Sonic is here. At least the voice of him is. The biggest issue from what I can tell is that chat told me that you have to buy certain abilities like blocking or dodging. If this is the case and they weren't lying to me, this has to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard because I couldn't find a single button that blocked or rolled. There is a dash button, but it really doesn't help as much as you think it would. I also had a hard time getting the hang of drawing your character's path for new forms or weapons, but this is easily just a me issue. While it was frustrating to keep failing these quick time events, I do like that they have little funny animations for failing them, giving a little charm every time you fail. Even after playing what I played, I do plan to make a full review one day of this game, but I also still don't know what is going on, but I'm still excited for my next trek back. There's also an HD version of the game, but from what I heard it's even clunker to play on those systems. Well, my final thoughts on this are, I see now where My Hero Academia got its inspiration from. Tokyo Mirage Session is Shin Megami Tensei crossover with Fire Emblem characters. If you never heard of Shin Megami Tensei, then it's the spin-off series of Persona 5, and only Persona 5. Persona 5 made Shin Megami Tensei. Persona 5. Also, you probably know Simply Dad if you know the Shin Megami Tensei series. Guy never shuts up about it. Love you though. It's been years since I played this, and I'm gonna be honest. I have no idea what's going on in this game. I just know Chrom looks like this now, and I don't know how to feel on that. I do see why this game was hated by both fans, since I feel like this game isn't a good entry for either of them. Shin Megami Tensei is known for its darker adult themes and actually attacking concepts that most RPGs usually shy away from, while Fire Emblem is a game where you control units in a tactical RPG fashion, like a chessboard, if the characters die, they die forever. And also, the fans get mad about not being able to hold underage girls' hands, so cool, I guess. 
This game is not at all close to fitting the darker themes of SMT since it's a very weeb idol like, and that's what threw off a lot of the SMT fans. The combat is also not even close to what Fire Emblem fans would be used to, and even though yes, these are Fire Emblem characters, they're not recognizable and easily could just be any random characters. I personally don't think this game is bad, I mean I played 6 hours of it before I stopped, but I can promise if I don't like an RPG, it gets about an hour for me before I dropped out quickly. I think this game has charm especially in the overworld and I get really nostalgic now for Shibuya since I've been there and got to see the iconic locations like the Hachiko statue. Man, I can't believe Tokyo Mirage Session, Ghostwire Tokyo, World Ends With You, Akiba's Trip, Kingdom Hearts 4, Persona 5, Tokyo Jungle, Jet Set Radio made Shibuya real. Personally, this feels more in line with the wackiness of Persona 5, but before Persona 5 was a thing. There's a Switch version that has all the changes that the Wii U version was hated for, like the fact they censored this girl to the point that they made her skin white on the outfit. I don't really care, but they could have tried better. If you're a fan of Persona 5, then get this because I don't see much being here for SMT or Fire Emblem fans, even if I do like the game. Now I want to use this section to cover games I own but no longer do, or games I bought and I legit never played on my Wii U. I have a problem where I just buy games by the way and I don't touch them for quite a while. I cannot tell you how many games I probably own that I've never even touched once. I don't even know what the disc fucking looks like. To put in perspective how bad this is, I remember one time I bought Gears of War like 2 or 3. I never opened it and then I found out a year later the fucking GameStop employee didn't even put the goddamn disc in the thing. So I bought this fucking game for $4 and took it home. This was never in there. Didn't even check. Never fucking dawned on me to check the goddamn disc if, if it was in there. So for the first game I'm going to talk about, I've never actually touched this. And it's Xenoblade Chronicles X. I just know it has mechs and I got it for $15. I know absolutely nothing about this series or any of the other games despite owning everything except 3. Game looks great and quite impressive it even ran on the Wii U. The next games being Splatoon and Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, while I love Splatoon 1 a lot, I never got into it again. I missed out on 2 and I'm still debating on getting 3. With that being said, even if I was to still own Splatoon 1, the servers without using fan servers are gone. The story mode is still there. But I did remember really loving the fact that the game was interesting and had a lot of charm for what it was. They even gifted us with this amazing post for those who know. All in all, I remember liking Splatoon, but I don't have anything to really say now. Same goes for Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. I remember playing it for like 30 minutes and I loved it, but I moved on from it after that. While it's now on the Switch with a new funky mode, I don't plan on ever getting it at the price it's at now. Yoshi's Woolly World and I love this game, but I ended up somehow losing it so I can't get footage of it. But I remember liking it and it has a very comfy vibe to it. The final game I never played but owned is Twilight Princess HD, and I don't have the Wolf Link amiibo so rip. While I may have not ever played the Wii U version, I've definitely played the GameCube version to death. I just never found time to get footage for this, since this isn't really a game where you can play for an hour and just be done. Since everyone knows the first hours of this game is slow and boring, even if it's supposed to be intentional to show Link's comfy and non-problematic life. But to sum it up, Twilight Princess HD looks amazing. It's crazy though how long this game took to be made since they used Twilight Princess CGI animation to show off the Wii U. But man, this world feels great still to this day. Even if the darker worlds do lose that blur that gave it this dreamlike feeling, I still can't hate them here. But I do hate the Amiibo Dungeon and now how you have to pay over $200 or you'll never get to experience it. But the music and gameplay, even if the bosses are basically interactive movies, this game still hits as hard as it did when I first saw the trailer for it on the X-Play. Twilight Princess is the game you've been waiting for. Sword play, sniffing, switch work, it's got it all. Even a baboon smacking its own ass. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess gets a five. <laughs> Five. This is finally the last Wii U game in my collection, and I did not play much of it when it came out, and I regret not making time to play this. That game is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I played around four to six hours and then stopped. I still don't know why I stopped back then. Maybe something else caught my interest. Maybe I didn't want to sink all that time into it like I needed for it. Again, who knows? The problem is, because I haven't played much of it, a lot of the positive stuff I can say is not even past the surface level of the game. 
just like how I love the environments and graphics or the ambience and soft piano music that just hits randomly and how it's peak relaxation or how the amount of things to explore is breathtaking but anything past the usual praise like this, I just can't form anything on since I still have yet to experience what this game really has to offer. I hate to end the last game here with this but I also would feel wrong if I tried to really give my insights onto this game since this is a game that really needs a full playthrough to give it the respect it deserves. To sum up what I played though, this game isn't perfect but it sure does feel damn close so far. The Wii U was a time capsule that will forever be stuck in the shadows and hardships of its failures. While I still and always will love the Wii U for what it did, I still need to remember the things it didn't do. The Wii U was such a hard blow to Nintendo, but as of recent years, they don't really seem to be dealing with the aftermath anymore of it. Thanks to the Switch doing what the Wii U wanted to do, but better in some aspects, it's safe to say portable gaming with console level graphics is finally here and it's moving full force. Once this video is out, I'll probably be putting my Wii U up and won't be heading back to it for a while, but I can safely say this whole video has given me the respect and love for the Wii U I remember having the day it came out. As Reggie said, they designed the experience of the Wii U to perfectly work with you. And I myself being that you can say, after all these years, I, I still love the Wii U. Thanks for watching guys.